time has come to finally start building our 5-3 for Eddie. The foundation of any build should start with a careful consideration to the rotating assembly, as these are the parts that are taking the brunt of the literal explosions happening during operation. The gaps between these parts are carefully designed to maintain the correct oil film thickness, which we'll touch on later. Measurements for these gaps are especially important when rebuilding used engines that already have mileage on them, where the potential for uneven wear is possible. We'll cover two methods of measurement in this video and how to go about them. To start with the first method, we'll need to have all main bearings and caps in place and torqued down. These LS engines use a 6-bolt design, but we'll only be worried about the mains and not the side skirt bolts. To ensure that we have a proper gap, we'll be following GM's torque specs, which are as follows. We'll want to torque the inner bolts to 15 foot-pounds in our preliminary pass, followed by an additional 80 degrees. The outer bolts get torqued to the same 15 foot-pounds initially, followed by an additional 53 degrees. You'll see me using a torque degree wheel to achieve this. Unfortunately, the one I purchased is of very poor quality and it tends to stick while going around if it even moves at all. I had to help it around with my other hand while I was torquing. It should be close enough for these measurements, but this is one tool that might be worth to buy name brand and not skimp on. Let's take a second and talk about what I'm doing with the measurement tools you see here. In an engine, the oil forms a thin film used to lubricate spinning components such as the crankshaft and the camshaft. The gap that this film is formed in must be finely tuned to maintain lubricity and maintain the correct oil pressure. We tune this gap by measuring the journals of the spinning component, in this case the crank, and the bearing that it rides in. If the gap is not correct, different size bearings can be obtained to change the oil gap. The size of this gap can vary greatly from application to application depending on factors such as power level, use case, and oil weight. It's also important to remember that as the metal parts heat up as the engine runs, the thermal expansion of these parts and changes in oil viscosity will affect the final oil pressure, so it's important to take that into consideration when specking out your gap. There are several methods that can be used to measure this gap. The first and often most common method used in the home garage is plastic gauge. This is a thin strip of material that is sandwiched between the journals and the caps, and the caps are then torqued to spec. As the caps are torqued down, the gap decreases and the plastic gauge squishes out to a width that correlates to a given gap. Then the caps are removed and the squish of the plastic gauge is measured using the provided scale on the packaging. The second and more tool-heavy approach is to use telescoping bore gauge sets and micrometers to determine the oil gap. To do this, let's refresh ourselves on how to use bore gauges and how to read vernier scales. Using the bore gauges is fairly straightforward. Loosen the knob at the end such that the telescoping tips are able to freely retract. Insert the bore gauge into the bore to be measured and gently rock it back and forth. You should feel a minimum point where the tips are compressed the most. Gently tighten the knob while continuing to rock the tool back and forth. The minimum point should now be captured and the reading can be taken. Before we measure it though, we'll need to know how to operate and read a vernier micrometer. Vernier refers to the mechanical method of measurement that relates a moving scale to a stationary scale to provide the measurement. They come in several flavors including calipers, micrometers, and you maybe even have a vernier scale on your torque wrench. Just kidding. We all know we keep going righty-tighty until the bolt becomes righty-loosey and then we swear our way over to the bolt extractor kit. To read a vernier micrometer, first ensure that the spindle and anvil are as clean as you can reasonably get them. Dirt, oils, and other debris can throw off fine measurements, so it's imperative that the measurement tool and the sample, a gauge block in this case, are clean. Make sure you don't drop a precision gauge block on your first day of engineering school, or you'll get to know what your professor's forehead veins look like. Ask me how I know that one. Now that you've made me relive that traumatic experience, it's time for me to tell you about Built Bottom End Performance Parts and Tools. From AN fittings to V-bands to ring compressors, Built Bottom End Performance has you covered. You can find them on the website, eBay, and on Amazon where you can take advantage of free Prime shipping if you're a Prime member. Alright, back to the measurement. Get your part to be measured in position and identify the range of micrometer you'll need. This part is less than an inch so I'll be using the 0 to 1 micrometer and not the 2 to 3 for example. These have a resolution of 10 thousandth of an inch or a tenth 
Gently spin the main thimble of the micrometer using the ratcheting knob until you feel it start to click. Gently lock the spindle in place and remove the part being measured. Observe where the thimble scale lands on the sleeve scale and note the first graduation. Ours is past the three but before the four, so our first digit is 300 thousandths. Next, count the number of smaller scale graduations in 25 thousandths of an inch increments on this micrometer. If you're just on the edge and aren't sure, if the main line is past the zero and into the smaller side of the thimble scale, include the graduation you can see. If you're before the zero and in the larger side of the thimble graduation, don't include the one you're not sure about. In this case, we're past the zero and into the smaller side, so we'll count up to the ones we can see past the 300 thousandths graduation. 2 times 25 thousandths each makes 50 thousandths that we'll add to the first observation for a total of 350 thousandths so far. Next, make a note of where the main sleeve line intersects the thimble scale. Here, we're just past the zero but not quite into the one, so the thousandths place will remain zero. Finally, find the vernier scale on the sleeve body that lines up most closely with the thimble vernier scale, and that'll be the ten thousandths of an inch, or tenths. The line that most closely matches here is the eight, or eight ten thousandths of an inch. Adding this to our final number gives us a total of 0 .3508 inches, or 3,508 ten thousandths of an inch. Now that we know how to use bore gauges and micrometers, we can combine the two and take the measurements you're seeing now. Either measure directly with the micrometers to obtain crank journal measurements, or use the bore gauge tool for bearings. Then simply subtract the diameter that you've obtained for the journal from that of the bearing to obtain your final value. This can be used with reference values to determine if your bearings are within spec. The technically correct way to do this would be to use a higher precision dial bore gauge with the micrometer, but those can get pricey. The telescoping bore gauge and micrometer is an intermediate approach somewhere between dial bore gauge and plastic gauge. If I were building a higher horsepower engine, I'd probably want to go the dial bore gauge route, but the telescoping bore gauge and micrometer set can be had cheap from somewhere like Harbor Freight, and you'll achieve a similar result. It should also be noted that I'm nowhere near a professional engine builder, so make sure you do your own research before attempting to dial in the clearances of your engine. Now that we have the measurements for the bearings, we'll move on to taking the crankshaft journal measurements. You'll also notice here that I'm recording two measurements for each journal 90 degrees off from each other to get an idea of the relative roundness of the journals. This isn't strictly necessary, I was just curious. My clearances are all in spec for what I've chosen, so bearing replacement will not be necessary here. The second measurement method is much more simple, but will still give you a good idea of your clearances. To use plastic gauge, first carefully drop the crankshaft into the block with the bearings in place. Then place a piece of plastic gauge onto the crank journal. The piece should be narrower than the width of the journal so it has room to squish out in the direction axial to the crankshaft. Repeat for the remaining journals and then put the main caps back on, being careful to put them in their correct place and orientation. Lightly tighten them all down and use the same torque specs we covered earlier to tighten them down. After they've been torqued, the plastic gauge has been sufficiently compressed and inspection can take place. You can then remove the caps and you can see the squish that's happened. Measure the width of the squished material with the scale on the plastic gauge packaging. They include both metric and imperial scales, which is nice. Once you've taken your measurements and recorded them, carefully clean off the residue using carb cleaner and a clean rag. I remove the crank here again to make sure I don't forget the assembly lube when I reinstall it for real. Depending on your application, both methods should suffice, although naturally they each have their pros and cons. For the average daily driver, plastic gauge is probably sufficient, as it's pretty much the gold standard, but of course higher duty situations might require a little more precision and finesse. Stay tuned for the next part in the series where we begin to assemble the bottom end and get one step closer to firing the pipes. Thanks for watching. 
Be kind and remember, not everything's black and white.